you don't have to take Look at I just have to look at me. I was like, oh shit, I got you. <laughs> so anyway, uh, long story there, but this is the class that where I met Walt, and then it turned out in the first of January, a little bit more timely to do time management, planning, goal setting. Great class. I did record it. I haven't uploaded it yet. I'll get that to you guys. Um, so so that's kind of like the, the 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 short of it. So we rescheduled this class on uh, realtor safety risk management you know being all that stuff being aware of your surroundings so walt i'm going to turn it over to you you add whatever other context you need to introduce yourself i appreciate that and then let's rip into it all right well i think that was pretty good i don't know that i really need to say anything else so this course if you guys are looking at the slide right i'm not going to regurgitate my bio to you you can look at the slides the reason there's not a lot of real estate related bullets on the on the slide here is because this course actually started uh, as something completely different and I, I still teach that course it's called abduction resistance and escape and it's about a three hour mini seminar where I talk about things like human trafficking and child abductions and things like that and then we get into some really hands-on stuff like we just don't have time it wouldn't work on a zoom but things like actual physical confrontations, how to get out of rope and duct tape and handcuffs and all kinds of other things if you found yourself in an abduction scenario and you needed to get out of it. So what I've basically done is pared that down into some data that is incredibly useful for anyone out and about in their normal daily life, but especially as a real estate agent. I don't think of, there's a lot of agents that really don't understand how dangerous our job can be because we are just, right, we're friendly people. We build relationships, that's what we do. And so by default, we're programmed to be as nice as we possibly can to random strangers in empty houses and just assume the best of everybody. <laughs> and while that usually works just fine, when it doesn't, the results can be disastrous. And so I've got some real world examples I'm, I might share as we go through this, but so that's kind of how this course came about. So that's enough about that. Um, what this course is not, let me caveat that first. Um, you saw the bio. I've done a lot of cool guy stuff. It doesn't really matter in this context. This course will not teach you to be a ninja. You are not going to learn all of the cool guy hands-on skills that'll make you Jason Bourne by watching a Zoom video. It's just not going to happen. What you are going to get is a lot of real world practical things that you can employ day to day in and outside of your real estate business to make you a safer person. And if you take what we'll talk about later and you practice with it, then you will absolutely be able to defend yourself as well if, if you find yourself you know, on the receiving end of a violent encounter. This is about a 98% solution. The reason I say 98% is because honestly, the physical confrontation is the, is the very last 2% if everything else up to this point has failed. There's a lot of things that you can do well before that to diffuse a situation and not have to get violent with somebody. So it's about a 98% solution. This is the quick course outline of what we're going to cover. Um, you'll notice in this bullet points, there's an overview of defensive tactics. Again, in the real course that I teach in person, I, I always joke, hey, this is the fun part. Wives, you get to choke your husbands now. And we actually get hands on and I teach about how to defend yourself against someone grabbing your wrist, someone choking you, someone putting you in a headlock. That's real world practical stuff, but you just can't teach that properly on a Zoom course. That, that has to be done in person. I will give you all some resources. I've actually posted a, a link to a Google Drive in the chat already, which will show you some videos that I have handpicked after scouring YouTube for hours because there's a lot of junk on YouTube. Those techniques that are being shown in those YouTube videos are quality, practical techniques that you can go practice with a trusted partner. And we'll talk a little bit more about how you do that. But there are ways that you can go practice that without having to go find some ninja Jojo somewhere and spend thousand dollars a year and, and get trained in a black belt, right? That, that's, there's real world simple techniques that you can learn to implement very quickly that will be beneficial to you. And then at the end of this, we'll do a quick Q&A session, make sure we cover all the high points for everybody. All right, so let's dive right into it. The first thing you have to understand is almost every violent encounter can be identified, 
and defused before it turns violent. And it's simply a matter of learning how to identify the nuances of something not going right. And, and a lot of times we understand this, right? We get that little gut feeling. And then because we're real estate agents, we automatically override that gut feeling because we want to be friendly with everybody, right? That gut feeling is usually right. So situational awareness and attention to detail truly are the 95% solution to most of the problems you'll find. You see on the, the slide there, the graphic of the OODA loop, the OODA loop. This was created years ago by somebody far smarter than me, but the concept is pretty simple. The human brain takes a certain amount of time to observe what's going on around them, process that data as it comes in, orient themselves to whatever the data is, where do I fit into this picture, decide on what the right action is based on that data, and then implement that decision into actual action, right? That takes time. And so I call that your reactionary gap. You can absolutely do things to reduce that reactionary gap and put yourself in a better position to respond to something that doesn't feel right well before you're, you become the victim of an attack. So this whole course is really designed to strengthen your OODA loop and give you some strategies that you can put in place to create more of a reactionary gap so that you can identify something got going wrong and either leave the situation completely or react accordingly to keep yourself safe. So one of the, the simple examples I use when I talk about situational awareness, we're horrible about this as real estate agents, is simply scanning the environment every time you go into and out of any particular situation. So on a super, super basic scale, I walk into Walmart and I stop at the door and I pan left to right. I'm not staring anybody down. I'm not mean mugging people in the store. I'm simply scanning the entire environment at eye level and making quick, fast eye contact with everybody. And even if I don't perceive it visually, my subconscious can, and yours as well, will pick up on something being off because we're so used to being in a certain environment that when something's not right in that environment, we pick up on it subconsciously. And that's when you get that gut feeling, right? The hairs on the back of your neck stand up and you can't quite identify what it is, but you know something is off about the situation. So in that, in that moment, you then have to decide, well, how important is it for me to be in this environment? Can I leave and come back later? Can I go somewhere else? And I take a moment to further process what I feel until I see what's going on so I can react properly. Same thing when you leave an environment. So if I walk out of a store and I'm about to go to my car, rather than you know the tried and true, like I'm checking the text and the emails because I'm a realtor and I'm busy, I will pause for a moment and I will scan the parking lot left to right, make on contact with anybody that might be out there. And then I'll walk to the car. Now, it sounds so simple, right? Well, you're just scanning the environment. That sounds so robotic. But here's the reality. Bad guys like easy targets. They don't want to be seen. They don't want to be heard. They don't want attention on the environment. They simply want to find the easiest victim, perpetrate the crime, and go away to do it again later. By making eye contact when you scan the environment, you can inadvertently diffuse yourself from being a victim without even realizing you did it because the person lurking in the corner waiting on that person that looks like an easy victim, you have seen them now. And that, therefore, they're no longer interested in making you a victim. It really can be that simple. So the attention to detail is huge, right? Picking up on the little nuances in the environments you're in already and trusting those spidey senses when they start to tingle to investigate further and figure out what's going on. So a couple common threat indicators. I'm not going to dive super heavy into this because this can get really technical into the, you know, the intel field. When I say surveillance, stalking, and vehicles, don't think of like, a three-day operation with some military guy in his binos staking out the base for, for days, right? This can be as simple as, uh, my wife actually picked up on this after years of being married to me, uh, the, a vehicle that you see so regularly in your daily routine that you, you pause and you think, why do I always see that same vehicle? So I use the Starbucks example because they're easy targets to pick on. If you were in a nine to five job and you had to be at work at a certain time, so you left your house at 6 a.m., 
you arrived at the Starbucks at 6.30, you grab your cup of coffee, you head to work. Every day, Monday through Friday, you leave at 6, you show up at 6.30, you grab your cup of coffee, you walk back to your car, you leave, okay? When you walk out of the Starbucks every single morning at 6.30-ish after getting your coffee and you scan the environment, you notice that there's a dark blue pickup truck directly across from your car and you just make a mental note because it's 6.30 in the morning, there's not a lot of cars in the parking lot. If you see that vehicle regularly, but no one's coming in behind you at the Starbucks, you might start to wonder, why do I always see this car? They're not there when I show up, but they're always there when I'm walking out of the store. And so you can use a, an acronym called TED, which stands for Time, Environment, Distance, and Demeanor, to both verify if something is off and to potentially disrupt something if you feel like it's not going your way. So as the Starbucks example, every single day when I walk out of Starbucks with my venti mocha chuca latte with the cinnamon sprinkles and I'm heading to work, there's that blue, dark blue pickup parked across from me in the dimly lit area. And so I say, well, I'm going to mix up time, environment, distance, and demeanor. I'm going to leave my house at 545 instead of 6 because this car is always pulling into the parking lot at 6.30 with me, I'm simply going to shift my schedule. That varies not only the time, but also the distance that I'll arrive. And now if I still see this same car when I leave the Starbucks, that I'm really gonna start to wonder why when I shifted my time, environment, and distance, they did too. And so that's an easy way to pick up on something that might be off, right? And so if you use the same analogy if you're walking through the mall. I walk into a store, I notice a gentleman, it, it walks in behind me. I go to another store, I notice this guy walks in behind me. I go to a third store, I see this guy behind me. Now I might say, well, this guy either has really, really similar shopping patterns or he's following me for some reason. And so how I would change my time and distance and environment is I would leave that third store and I would walk back to the first store I came to because there's no reason to go back to that store. I've already been there. If this person follows me into the same store we've already been to, now my spidey senses really start to go off and I'm either going to leave the scenario completely, uh, depending on how uncomfortable you feel and what your environment is, you might go to find the mall security and say, listen, something's up with this dude, he's off, he's, making, he's creeping me out, he's following me around the store. Can you just go talk to him? And in that moment that they're chatting with him is your opportunity to leave. Now, you probably won't necessarily deal with that in a real world scenario, but if you do, it's good to understand how you can vary those little bit of variables to identify if somebody is actually watching you, stalking you, you know, ex-boyfriend, creeper kind of stuff. More importantly, is probably in a, in a real estate scenario, the pre-fight anatomical indicators that you see on the slide. It is very difficult, unless you're highly, highly trained, to get violent with somebody without your body telegraphing that you're going to get violent with somebody. It's an anatomical stressor, even for the person that's about to get violent. And so you will see things like they're talking to themselves and they're kind of mentally going through what they're about to do. They might weave back and forth as they prepare themselves. They might roll their shoulders or clench their fist. If you see those things happening outside of a normal environment where someone might be ready to hit somebody, that's probably a good indication that something's off with that person and you should either give yourself some distance or leave the environment. You will almost always, if you're paying attention to these things, notice them before they occur. Now, this is kind of worst case scenario because at that point, you're already right in front of someone that could get violent, and, and, but it happens. I'll give you a quick uh, example. Literally just this past weekend, I, I run a Facebook page. The Google Docs has the link to the Facebook page. It's called Real Estate Safety and Self-Defense. I talk a lot more in, in depth about all the stuff I'm going to cover today. One of my agents that's in that Facebook group posted that this Saturday, they went to a house to show it to a client, standard routine. She shows up. The clients are not there yet. They're running late. So she's waiting in the car. And she watches the neighbor from directly across the street leave their house, walk across, and approach her car. Being the friendly real estate agent she is, she rolls down her window, strikes up a conversation. Hey, I'm your neighbor, blah, blah, blah. They get out. They start walking the property. The neighbor is telling them all about the grounds and the yard and the neighborhood, and he's just being a super friendly guy. 
So in preparation for her clients arriving at any moment, she goes and she goes, let's go ahead and get the house unlocked and we'll go in. Now, the moment they went into the empty house, the entire demeanor of that individual changed and he walked behind her into the kitchen and blocked her way. And she said it was obvious at that point that something bad was about to happen. She, she was terrified. Thankfully, she had some tools in her purse that she um, was conscious enough to back up and put her hand in her purse just in case. But she truly thought that there was about to be a violent encounter. And literally right at that moment, her clients walked through the door because she, they saw her car and, they, and it diffused the entire situation. And we were talking about this afterwards. And so we talked about, listen, you gotta, you gotta file a police report on this. This guy's watching from across the street. God knows how many other lone female agents are gonna walk into this vacant house with this guy. But that was a scenario where everything was perfectly normal until it wasn't. And she picked up on the cues that something bad was about to happen. And thankfully she didn't have to act because the, the, the clients walking in diffused the situation. But you can absolutely trust your gut when something doesn't feel right, right? We, we, we already know subconsciously when something bad is happening, almost always, that gut is going to be right. So trust it when you see it. All right, let's move on a little bit. Okay, so again, we talked about the situational awareness. If you see a situation occurring, by all means, leave the situation if you can. Some quick ways on how to not be a victim. I talked about scanning the environment already. Anytime you leave a, a, a location, anytime you enter a location, right? Same thing with a, with a house. If you go into an, a house that you've never been into, take a moment to scan the environment when you first walk in the door and be scanning it as you move into different rooms. You just never know what you'll encounter. The other thing I always like to highlight because so many people have a problem with this, make eye contact with people. You don't have to mean mug them. You don't have to stare them down. But so many people feel intimidated for some reason by, by, by looking someone in the eyes. A bad guy wants to be anonymous. They want to find a victim, perpetrate their crime, and leave with as little bit of information as possible being left behind. If you make eye contact with people, that bad guy has been seen. He knows he's been seen. He will very likely not choose you as the victim. Now, that doesn't mean he won't go find another victim, but at least it won't be you today. Display self-confidence and self-awareness, right? I talked about that as the whole, the walking through the parking lot thing. This thing, we're tied to it. Put it down until you're in a familiar spot. If you are in an unknown area, you're walking through a parking lot, you're walking into a house, put this thing down and pay attention to what's going on around you. Head up, shoulders back, chest out, exude a little self-confidence that goes a long way. Again, it's a predator and prey mentality Predators are looking for the weakest prey they can. If you look like you're self-confident and aware, they're, they're going to choose someone that's not. It's, it's proven over and over again. The, the psychology of violent offenders shows us that they look for the easy targets. So don't be that easy target. Um, I, I can't say too much more about that. Protect your personal space. Now, this is a little easier now, right? Because COVID, right? hey, six feet, buddy, right? No big deal. But... Um, even in an open house situation, think about the distance that you're keeping people. I like to keep people out of arm's reach of me at all times. So for example, if I'm hosting an open house, where am I probably standing? Probably somewhere around the kitchen, maybe the dining room. That's pretty standard. If I'm standing in the kitchen between the countertop and the center island, and somebody walks around the countertop to look at the kitchen, I'm simply going to walk to the other side of the center island. So now the island is between me and this person. I have personally known agents in central Virginia before I moved to Florida that spent several days in the emergency room because they hosted an open house and got beat practically to death by some ridiculously crazy dude with a crescent wrench who just happened to show up to the open house, signed in to the open house, walked around, and when the house was empty, went back to his car, picked up a crescent wrench, walked back into the house, and tried to force the realtor to do what he wanted to do. She was smart enough to know that she was not going to comply. She was going to fight this guy off until she couldn't fight anymore. But in that fighting process, she got beat pretty bad with a crescent wrench, and she went to the hospital for days. It happens. 
keep people at a distance because you just don't know when what they're up to. And we deal with this all the time. We're always, we're always in the room with strangers. It's okay to realize, listen, they're strangers. I don't know their best intentions yet. I'm going to assume that they're here for a good reason, but I'm going to prepare as if they are not, okay? And then last but not least, use your voice. It is okay to be a jerk sometimes. And so the example I typically use, but this applies in any scenario, you're out pumping gas, you're scanning the environment because you're smart, you're paying attention, you're not focused on, you, you don't need to watch the gas pump. It's going to tell you when it's done pumping, right? Pay attention to what's going on around you. And someone starts walking across the parking lot towards you. You see them, you say, hey, how are you doing, right? All I've done is acknowledge, I see you, I know that you're there. I didn't have to be a jerk about that. If they continue to approach you and maybe they do something like, hey, man, you got the time? Or, hey, could I bum a cigarette? You got a light? My immediate response to those is, no, I don't. Leave me alone. Now, if that person actually just wanted a dollar, wanted a cigarette, wanted a light, first of all, I don't have any of those anyway, so I, don't, I can't help you. If the worst thing that happens in my day is some random thing or stranger thinks I'm an asshole because I said, no, I don't. Leave me alone. I'm okay with that. Because you just don't know what their real intentions are. And again, I don't want people in my personal space. So by verbally letting them know, listen, dude, I'm not interested. I don't have what you want. I can't help you find somebody else to talk to. Right? In a very forceful, not rude, not belligerent. You don't have to drop an F-bomb on them. But in a very clear tone, I'm not interested and I don't have what you want. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that whatsoever. And again, you will defuse a situation before it occurs without even knowing it. Yeah, you might, that guy might go home and it's like, God, that guy was a jerk. All I wanted was a cigarette. That's okay. It's not going to end your world. No big deal. So use your voice. Don't be afraid. All right, let's say for a moment that absolutely everything we've talked about so far, you have failed miserably. Hopefully you haven't. And you were not paying attention. You were engrossed in your phone you didn't see something occurring, and now you are face-to-face -face with a violent account. Now, how do you react properly in that bad situation, right? So the first thing that you want to do is get as much attention on the situation as you can, right? And again, we, we're hardwired. When we get afraid, we get quiet because I'm spooked and I'm nervous and I don't know what's going on. You need to train your brain to get loud when you get nervous, right? If something scares you, let people know. And so kick, scream, break stuff, whatever you got to do, use the tools that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Get as many eyes on the situation as you possibly can. Because again, we go back to the psychology of bad guys. They don't want attention on the situation. They want to perpetrate the crime and get away with it. So the more attention you put on it, the quicker you can diffuse that situation. And maybe you don't actually have to fight them off. Maybe you just getting loud was enough to make them scoot. Um, that happens more often than not. If you decide it, it's time to fight, you, you fight. There's no half-ass in this, right? Your life may actually depend on your actions in the next 30 to 60 seconds. So if you've made the conscious decision to fight somebody, it's freaking honey badger time, right? It's vicious. Whatever you got to do, bite, claw, scream, rip their face off, right? This is not a, I'll slap you and hope that you go away. Like, this is, you chose to interfere with me. Now you have to pay the price because I'm about to get violent with you, right? You crossed the line and now you have to pay for that. It, it's, it's sheer violence of action at that point until one of two things occurs. Either the, the bad guy is no longer able to fight you and, and the situation is over or you are in a position where you can't fight anymore. So let me go back for one second because I said decide to fight. Most times, if the situation allows it, it, it the best option will actually be not to fight. If you are in a situation where you see this occurring early enough and you can make a conscious decision, do I fight this guy or do I hit, hit the road the other direction? The Nike defense, as I call it, right? Turning and running away from the scenario is usually the best choice. And I say this as a, as a former military guy, I like to hit people. I've studied Krav Maga for years, right? I've done some cool guy stuff. I love violence in the right, you know, in the right context, of course. 
the right answer is not to be violent unless you have to. So for example, you're doing an open house. Somebody comes into the house, they lock the door behind them. Well, you don't really have a choice to run at this point. You, this is not your house. Maybe it's a listing that you've been in once or twice. You don't know what's behind every room. The last thing you wanna do is run into a scenario where you're even more secluded from the outside world. So the answer may be my only way out that I know of is through that door that you're standing in front of. And buddy, you better believe it. I'm going through you on my way to that door. So you may have to be violent. Do not stop fighting until either the attacker is disabled in some way to allow you to escape safely, or you honestly feel like you are outmatched, outgunned, outnumbered, and you risk being killed or, or severely maimed by continuing to try to fight and lose. And so I use this as an example in my abduction, resistance, and escape, right? There is a point where if you're about to get knocked unconscious or you feel like you're about to get beat to the point where you, you can't be aware of your, your surroundings, it actually is better for you to stop fighting, present yourself as a victim, and, and wait for another opportunity to either fight again or escape. And there's a little bit more that goes into that, but you get the idea. If you make the choice to fight, fight until the fight is over, until you've won. And we'll talk a little bit about some ways that you can fight in a moment. Before we get into that, however the scenario ends, right? You saw something coming, you were able to verbally de-escalate it, okay, no big deal, right? Life's gonna go on. If a violent encounter in any way happens, even if someone attempts to be violent with you and you diffuse it, like the situation I mentioned on Saturday, right? That was clearly about to be a bad situation. She was 100% sure of it. But the, the clients coming in diffused it, okay? She was going to let it go, right? Nothing bad happened to me. I got creeped out. It shook me all day, but it's done. And I, I, I sat her down. I was like, listen, it's not done. This is clearly a bad person. They intended to do harm to you. You need to report this. Take a moment. You're going to be rattled. You're going to be stressed. Take a moment to recall using all of your senses, all of the little nitty gritty details you can imagine. Did they speak to you? If so, what did it sound like? Did they have an accent? Did, were they having, did they have a slang? Did they slur their words? What were their mannerisms? Did they talk with their hands? What were their facial expressions? Did they have a scar? Did they have a tattoo? Did they, what did they smell like? They smelled like mechanics grease, right? Any little detail you can recall will assist the authorities on putting a profile together to potentially put that person in jail before they do harm to another victim. Right? Or even if, even if the unfortunate scenario happens and they do harm to another victim and they get caught, they might be able to tie this incident in with that one and charge them greater, put them away for longer. So always be mindful of all of the different things you can think about. If you have to report something, really take a moment to think through all of these different things and report, over-report. Right? It's okay if you report something to the police because you felt like it was a bad scenario. Leave it in the police's hands to do something or not. Don't leave it up to chance because you just don't know who the next victim might be. And if you can interrupt that bad person from finding another victim, why wouldn't you, right? All right. Now, a quick overview on self-defense techniques. Again, the Google Doc has some videos that are very good. I've vetted them. I've watched them all. They're very similar to what I teach. Uh, you have to practice those before you, you're not going to watch a YouTube video and, and understand how to do this stuff right. You have to get with a trusted partner, get with your get with your real estate group and practice this stuff somewhere. A couple high points though, right? Strength versus technique. I will tell you as a guy who's almost six foot tall and has never weighed more than 160 pounds, technique will win every single time. There are things that you can do to put the odds in your favor, regardless of the size of the perpetrator, right? My 16 year old daughter, who's a buck 10, knows how to do every technique that I'm gonna talk about. And she can do it effectively against me, who knows exactly what she's going to do. But if, if you do it right, it works. Um, I, that's enough said about that. So you have to learn proper techniques and practice them so that they are muscle memory. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Open palm versus closed fist. Why do I bring this up? In all of the cool guy movies, you always see two badasses duking it out, right? They're always punching and elbowing and all this stuff. Well, here's the reality. 
if you don't know how to properly throw a punch, you are actually more likely to break your own hand when you hit this person. And now you are in pain and pain can often override your sense of let's keep thinking through the process and know what to do next. And that puts you in a very bad position. As opposed to open palms, which not only give you great striking options, defensive options, but it actually looks very tame. I have an entire write-up on why having open hands makes really good sense and my Facebook group. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples, right? I'm out in a scenario and I see something in the distance, somebody's coming my way, it doesn't quite look right. I might be talking to somebody and my hands are up here because we're, they're close enough to my personal space, I'm uncomfortable, but not enough that I need to tell them to get the hell out of my face, right? And so if my hands are already up here, it's really easy to put them up here. Now, I've been all over the world a couple of times, I've been to a lot of different countries. This is a universal stop sign. If I put my hands up at you and I say, leave me alone, get away from me, the hands and the facial expression, I don't need to speak your language, you know what I'm saying, you leave me alone. However, from the outside looking in, I'm not violent, I'm non-confrontational. The, the guy was asking him to stop, he had his hands up, right? This is a very, very tame, scenario where if there is onlookers watching this and something goes to court, maybe I have to go to the, the, the police for something. Maybe I got to go to court for a violent attack. Maybe there's a civil suit. Who knows what might happen? All of the witnesses are going to say, Walt was not aggressive at all. He had his hands up. He was asking the dude to stop. But from here, I'm actually ready to murder you. It just doesn't look like it. And so what I'll, what I'll tell you is, the base of your palm, right where your wrist and the base of your palm comes together, if you put your finger on that, there's a nice solid bone right there. And that bone is significantly stronger than any knuckle in your hand. And it will do lots and lots of damage for you without having to worry about breaking your own knuckles, breaking your wrist, et cetera. So if my hands are here and I need to strike you or push you, it's very easy to do this. And I simply strike you at the meaty base of my palm anywhere I can get to you. And I'm gonna talk about the key target areas right there. Not, eyes and nose are great, right? If I can make you not breathe well, if I can make you not see well, I now have the opportunity to leave the situation. Um, it's, it's pain and it is interrupting their ability to do the, the things they need to do. It's disrupting their senses. Um, so strike here if you can reach it. If you're similar height, similar size, you're both standing, strike the face with your open palms. The next best spot is the throat, right? If you're shorter and maybe you can't really get to their, their nose and their eyes very good, reach up underneath the chin, near the throat, near the Adam's apple, right? You can push and strike in that area. And doing so, if you control somebody's head, you control their whole body. So even if you just get a good push, you're still gonna send them off balance. You're gonna have the opportunity to either strike again or get out of the situation. And then last but not least, we all love to talk about this one, right? The groin is a wonderful target. Whether you are on the ground because you got blindsided and pushed over and someone's about to get over the top of you, whether someone has got their hands on you already and you need to disrupt their mental process by throwing a quick strike to the groin to get them thinking about how bad that hurts instead of what they're trying to do to you, uh, the groin is a wonderful target. You put all these together and you continue to hit those targets until the targets are no longer there because the person is done, you're going to be all right. Last but not least, some most common scenarios. Now, these are true for really any violent encounter, right? So I'm trying to abduct a child. I'm trying to rape a woman. I'm trying to mug you, but I need to drag you over into the alley first. I'm in an open house, but I want you in the master bedroom so no one sees what I'm about to do, rob you, et cetera. These are things that a person might do to get you from one location to the other so that they can affect violence against you. You'd be amazed how popular wrist grabs and hair pulls are, um, especially with men trying to do something to a woman or a child because we just assume, right, that the mental is, I'll just muscle this. I'll just brute strength you out of the scenario. And so they might grab your wrist, drag you to wherever they want to drag you. Very similar with the hair. They will grab your hair because, again, if they control your head, they control your body. They will grab your hair and pull you off balance to wherever they want you to go. Uh, the chokes and the headlocks and the bear hugs, right? 
you'd be amazed how often those come up as well. The, but really the, the top two are, are hair pulls and wrist grabs when I'm trying to drag you somewhere else. Um, I'm not gonna try to explain how you get out of these on video because it just would get quirky and you wouldn't see that well. I'm giving you videos of people that are teaching the techniques very well. Watch those videos. And then what I recommend you do, and I'll talk a little bit more about it at the end, get with someone you trust to practice the defenses to these scenarios in a very slow and methodical way until you get the mechanics down properly. Then with that person you trust, ask them to ramp it up. Hey, let's go 25%. Okay, that feels like I've still got it. Let's go 50%. All right, like for real this time, pin me to the wall, choke me, like no joke, let's go. And you build up to a point where you can do these things instinctually very quickly, very violently, but you can't watch the YouTube video and then go 100% speed, right? You have to build the mechanics before you do that. So take your time with this, but take the time to learn it. And if you, um, if you don't wanna do this specifically, these videos, go find a place in your local market that teaches practical self-defense related things, not American Taekwondo Academy where they're gonna follow a kata and you're gonna have to do, okay, number one, strike with the palm, number two, right, number three. Violence is not paint by numbers. You have to be able to assess the situation that you find yourself in, respond to the immediate threat, and then counterattack as quickly and violently as you can to disrupt that person's reactionary gap to allow you time to either continue to fight or to leave. So get somewhere that understands that and is willing to let you get hands on with people because that's where you're really gonna get the training that you want. All right. A short of the actual violent encounter, let's talk a little bit about tools that you can keep with you really anywhere that are incredibly effective. So I've got a few on the slide. You'll notice what's not on the slide. How many people carry a firearm? You don't have to raise your hand, right? Immediately when I think, when people say self-defense tool, right, they usually think things like firearm, stun gun, right? The reason those are not on the slide is because not everyone will carry one and that's perfectly fine. And even those that do carry them, in a very close environment, a firearm is usually not your best option. And I say this as a, as a, as a firearms instructor. The ability to quickly understand what's happening, process the attack, put together the plan of, of defense, and then try to draw a concealed pistol puts you way behind the power curve. And so there are things that you can do otherwise that are more effective than carrying a concealed firearm, quite frankly. So we're gonna talk about some tools that you can take with you absolutely anywhere. Um, obviously your situational awareness, again, I can't overstate this, your attention to detail will keep you out of a bad situation 90 plus percent of the time. Um, some other things you can keep with you, your keys, right? Nobody thinks twice if you're carrying your car keys in your hand. Everyone thinks twice when you're carrying a gun in your hand, right? You can't go walking through Walmart or the parking lot with a gun out, just, well, just in case, just in case. But you can keep your keys in your hand in case you need to use those keys as a defensive tool to scratch somebody's face, poke somebody in the eye. That, that's a very valid use of your keys. Um, a metal barrel pin. I, and you'll notice on the slide, like this is my pin. I've had, I carry this pin everywhere I go. This is actually a reenlistment gift from a former Navy command. I don't mean a $65 hoo tactical flashlight or tactical pen or tactical anything. A solid metal barrel pen that you can get at Office Max, Office Depot. Look for something that is uh, rotating instead of push button because that will allow you to have a nice flat base on the back to plant your thumb against. In the event you need to use this as a tool to defend yourself, Planting your thumb on the back of this pen and going after somebody's eyes and throat can do a lot of good for you. You can carry this anywhere. I take this to the airport. I go, anytime I travel, the pen is in my pocket. It's a pen. Nobody thinks about it as a defensive tool, but it makes a fantastic defensive tool, right? So get a, get a good quality metal pen and, and have that with you at all times. Tactical flashlight. Again, it looks mean because it's black and it's beveled and there's chisels and like this could do some damage. But again, it's just a flashlight. I can take this into any courthouse, any federal building, on school grounds, in the airport. When I fly, this is on my hip in the airplane. But it's 2,000 lumens. 
which will literally blind you in broad daylight. And it's got a beveled strike bezel. So again, think of the scenario you might use this in. I'm in an open house, someone comes in, they lock the door behind them, they want to do bad things. My only option is to go through them to get out of this house. This flashlight can temporarily blind them and give me a moment to step in and strike them very violently to clear that scenario and let me leave, right? That's, that's the goal at that point is I'm going to escape, but I have to go through you. Super great tool. Now these are a little pricier than the pen, right? You can buy these pens anywhere. Flashlight might run you 100, 150 bucks, but man, it's, it's a lot cheaper than a firearm. You can take it anywhere and it's very, very effective. And it's fun to get your buddies while you're at the staff meetings and just pop them in the eye and they're like, God dang, right? That's just fun. You should test those out on your, on your fellow realtors. It's good. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about, you can literally get these uh, Amazon for three and a half bucks. I, I did stocking stuffers for my entire family for these. It's a personable, audible alarm. They range anywhere from 125 to about 145 decibels. You can connect them to your belt loop, your keychain, your purse strap, a kid's backpack. They just clip right on. And all you have to do is pull this cord about a quarter of an inch. And it gets loud and annoying very quickly. I mean, it's probably much louder at, at, at my end. That will get as many eyes as possible on the situation, which again is the goal. Here's the beautiful thing about these. If I accidentally pull that cord because I perceive that Jeff, man, he's a brawling looking dude and he looks violent. I feel uncomfortable in this situation. Let me preemptively diffuse this situation by putting all of the eyes and ears on it. Maybe Jeff didn't mean any harm at all. Maybe Jeff honestly just wanted to check with me to see if I had the time. Jeff's not hurt. I'm not hurt. No firearm was discharged. There's no civil liability. There's no criminal penalty. The entire situation is diffused for three and a half dollars and five seconds of loud noise. And I simply go, oh, my bad guys, sorry about that, pull the cord. No, <laughs> no, 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 right? They're a really, really great tool to carry with you. Um, and again, they go anywhere. They clip to anything that you can clip a keychain to, you can take this with you. And this is the quiet one. That's 125 decibels. The 145 decibels will literally start causing ear damage if you're right up on somebody with it. And then last but not least, all of the other tech tools, gadgets, apps that are out there, right? The National Association of Realtors, they try, right? Real estate safety is not something that is done well. And it's not their fault. There's just, there's not a lot of experience on how to get violent with somebody in a good way, right? We don't talk about these things like attention to detail, scanning an environment, verbal de-escalation, right? We talk about things like apps, GPS trackers, well, set a safety timer. So if you go into this house and you don't call in 15 minutes, we'll know something's wrong and we'll call the police. Look, I can kill you 37 times in 15 minutes. 15 minutes is way, way, way too long. If you walk into a bad environment, that 15 minute timer doesn't help you in that case, right? So yes, all of the preemptive stuff is great, right? Meet them in person first, somewhere safe. Get a copy of their ID. All of those are great. But at the same time, if there's a time delay on your safety mechanism, time is not on your side in a violent encounter. And so that may not be the best option. Now, there is one great tech tool that I will leave with you, and I put the link to it in the chat. It's, an, it's a system called Forewarn, and it is designed for the real estate industry. And it will allow you to run somebody's background prior to you meeting them. I'll give you a quick example. Literally on a, on a team meeting today, one of our young new agents was chatting with one of our team leaders, new buyer client pops up, seems perfectly fine, very chill on the surface, but she's a new agent and our senior agent is going to shadow her to the showings. So they schedule a showing. She loops our senior male, senior agent in, the client cancels. I got this thing, I'm done. So they reschedule. Let's do this showing over here. I'm going to bring this guy. Oh, I'm in the hospital today. 
on and on. So they ran this guy in forewarn. They should have did it first, but that's okay. They ran this guy through forewarn. He has 52 different criminal records. Everything from fraud to perjury to violence. This was not a good dude, but he was a career criminal and you would never notice talking to him, interacting with him, getting on a Zoom conference from with him. He seemed like a perfectly normal person until they ran his record and they went, oh, well, that's why he keeps canceling. You're a young, pretty agent and I'm not because I'm a big brownie dude. He doesn't want to be in the house with a big brownie dude. We're gonna, we're, we're done with this guy, right? And who knows what situation they diffuse, but that's a great system to use to be able to preemptively check on a client especially if they're, hey, we're flying in from out of town, we're going to meet real quick, and you don't have a lot of time to vet them and pre-screen them, I have super, super great app. All right. Last but not least, I'm going to jump to this slide real quick. All of the stuff you see on this slide, all these YouTube links are in the Google Doc that I posted, so you can grab them along with the Facebook page link. So if you want a deep dive on tactical flashlights, on how to use your hands properly, on personable audible alarms, on stun guns, and everything else, Check out the Facebook group. It's completely free. It's only for real estate related folks. And we'll go back to that slide, open it up for any questions. I'm going to unshare my screen so y'all can look at my ugly mug and my Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> all right, let me just scan through the chat here. So Robert said, for that reason, I carry my gun all the time. Robert, absolutely. And if you are aware of the situation, you will have a slight advantage on being able to carry that gun. But there are times, and if you trained with it properly, you understand, there are times where I'm too close to the bad guy or the bad guy got the initial advantage. And unless you know how to fight somebody and control their body while you single-handedly lift your shirt and draw your pistol, your gun is not going to help you a lot. And unfortunately, most people just don't get that level of training. And so their gun can actually become a liability if they try to get it and it is wrestled away from them from the bad guy. Uh, just something to think about. Absolutely. I'm, a, I'm a concealed carry holder as well. I teach people how to do it. There's nothing wrong with carrying one, but not everybody carries one. Can I repost the Google Doc link? Absolutely. Hold on one second and I'll repost it. Right at the, it's right at the top of the chat, but I'll drop it in again. I already clicked on it and opened up in my browser. I'll have the chat as well. Now I lost my chat button. Hang on. Where'd my chat go? <laughs> Sorry, I got too many tabs you guys on my team, I'll post Bam, there's your Google Doc again. If anybody wants to grab that. Gotcha. So Robert, yeah, ex-police officer, you understand the dynamic of keeping people at a distance, right? You, you got that. You can read people. Uh, a lot of people can't, but you got it. Yeah, you do you, man. You're going to be just fine. Um, what other questions do we got? Do you have any tips on keeping belongings safe in an open house? Um, your belongings or the listers' belongings? Um, your belongings keep with you at all times, right? If you if you have a purse, never be out of hands reach of your purse. Uh, for the sellers, right? Have a conversation, of course, about what makes sense for them to lock up or take with them. Quick example: I did a. Uh, super, super great family. I wound up doing multiple deals with their whole family. Wonderful people. But when I went to the listing appointment to list their house and I'm walking through the house, their teenage son had his AR-15 hanging on a nail from the wall. And I thought, oh, cool. Does he get to shoot very often? But then I thought, mm, we don't want to leave that there, right? <laughs> not, not only might it turn off a buyer, but it also might be stolen, right? You just, you want to be mindful of those things. Uh, obviously, don't keep a lot of flashy stuff out if you can help it, right? Don't leave your, you know, your Rolex on the little soap dish in front of the counter where everyone can see it, right? Put that stuff away, absolutely. Your own stuff as the listing agent hosting the open house, just keep it with you. Keep it on your person at all times. What else we got? We're, we're 10 minutes before we have to wrap, so I got, I was a little worried that one was going to run long, so we did good. I, I, I kept the sea stories at bay as best I could. <laughs> you guys can unmute yourself on Zoom. Anybody here have anything? Did you see that for uh, for forewarn? Is that an app or website or yep, what's an app, right? Well, forewarn. Yeah, so it's uh, you can go to the website again. I'll copy and paste that. It's only for the real estate industry, and you sign up for it. 
And it, it's, it's a, I think they have an app as well, but they basically allow you to vet people, run a background check on people before you meet them in person. So if they are a nefarious person with a criminal record, you'll know it going in. There's a fee attached to that, I'm assuming. I, I, so it depends. So some brokerages are starting to pick it up and offer it to their agents for free. And others, it's you got to pay for it if you want it. What a great free yeah, That's great. Yeah. yeah. I, I wish I would have had that like literally a few weeks ago. Um, I got catfished by a buyer and it was a girl, you know, but literally catfished. I showed her and her wife the house and she's telling me all this stuff and it's crazy just how how much dishonesty is out there. But I was going to mention that in my experience, um, men actually need to be a little bit more aware of that they're not invincible. You know, my partner, David Stoko was murdered. Um, and so they're not invincible. Just because you're a man doesn't mean that you're not going to get attacked. Right, you know, right. so that that's just one of my, <clears throat> yeah. And a gun did not help in that situation at all, you know. So um, it made it worse, actually. So I, I don't know. I'm a big gun fan, but well, Walt, the per, one of the first things you talked about was like scanning the environment, making eye contact, and and you know making noise. Um, because I think we go about our day daily lives and we don't think about this shit, right? Yeah. Especially if nothing's happened to you. Some of us have had things happen and probably more hyper aware if you've been attacked before. But those of us that are fortunate enough not to be in that situation, I think just paying attention and looking at people um, is probably the, the greatest takeaway from this whole class for me. Yeah. And, and this is none of this is really real estate specific, right? Other than you know the four one up. Everything that I'm talking about, you can put it into practice all day long to keep yourself safe, right? There, there are other areas of our lives that can be potentially unsafe as well. So the problem with violent encounters is you don't know when they're going to happen usually until you're in a scenario where they might happen, right? You, you don't get to predict it. And then so I'm just not going to go out on Wednesday because bad things might happen on Wednesday. You typically are in the scenario in some way and you're like, well, I don't want to be here. Now, if you do it, if you if you notice that well in advance, you can get out of that scenario and not have to worry about it. But bad things happen all the time, and you don't know when they're going to happen. So it helps to be prepared. Perfect. We have somebody here in the office that wants to share something, Sherry. Well, I've been a victim before. Um, I was beat up really, really bad, and it happens so fast. And I would somebody was watching over me. But I was beat up bad, and um, it happened when I was younger. But what's happened to me is that's affected my whole life. I mean, I, I'm very much aware of circumstances, and sometimes I'm over aware. But, you know, I spent some time in the hospital from it. And the, the thing of it is, is the guy that beat me up was very good looking, married, and had four kids. Jeez. So it's not, it's not, it wasn't like there was a lot of oh, alarms, yeah, yeah, yeah. alarms yeah. didn't go off. But um, I've, I've had to fight through that my whole life. <sighs> because I, I mean, and but I made up my mind it wasn't going to stop me or change my life. But I'm very much aware of on a previous job, you know, one thing that they asked me to do was do one on one trainings. There's no way that I'm going in to a strange city one on one with a person. And that was because of that. Mm -hmm. So I chose not to do that. I just thought, there's no way I'm going to put myself, I don't know this person that well. I'm not going to go put myself in that, in that. So I passed that opportunity up. But when I, I carry mace in my pocket, my husband is in law, was in law enforcement. So, I mean, he's taught me not to not to get myself in a situation where they can get behind you. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that you have to be aware of your environment, just like you said. So you don't let them get behind you at any, any means. And I don't go, I don't follow them into a small space like a bathroom either, because then they have more control over you. 
So just very much aware, but very much out there, I'm telling you. Yeah. Good for you. Being strong. Mm -hmm. This is many years ago. Still, girl, I mean, you know, to be attacked. I, I, I had that happen in an open house. Um, two homeless men came in uh, off the street. And by the grace of God, I kind of clicked at the same time. There was another couple upstairs, and I left these guys downstairs and went up to the other couple and asked the husband to please stay. You know, so I mean, you learn the hard way, but that's that's how we have to learn, you know. And thank you for sharing. I mean, well, I it's, you it's just, just, it's not a joke. No, it's not a joke. And the more you can be aware of your surroundings and, and prevent it. I mean, I work for a builder. I do, I get open houses all the time, but I always tried to have a jacket and I, in my pocket, I always had mace. I figured if I could just get them startled enough, I could I maybe have a chance to flee. Mm -hmm. I do carry a gun, but I know that they could take the gun away and use it on me. Yeah, and that's what happened with Dave. Yeah. Is they did. They, and, but he was stupid. I, I mean, God love him, but he was stupid. We all told him not to do what he did is he went to serve his drug addict tenants um, an eviction notice without the police presence. And we said, don't do it. And he took a gun with him and literally they overpowered him, took the gun, shot him, stuffed his body into a, a basically the size of a cardboard box in, in the side of the wall and then went off in his car joyriding. So, I mean, uh, men, I just, it's really one of those men just think they're invincible kind of thing is, is how I feel because like all of the guys that were with my brokerage at that time and we all were affected by it, every single one of those guys had done that as well that evicted and took their gun, stop, 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 but you know and dave was not a small guy he worked out every day he was fit as a fiddle and they overpowered him you know so i just i don't know but uh, thank you sherry for sharing i'm sorry that happened to you i have a comment kind of question for walt too Okay, here we better. Yeah. Um, I had a situation where I had been showing this guy tons of homes and he was from out of state or something. Um, but every time he walked into a home, he would comment on the on the cameras in the home. And he'd be like, Oh, there's lots of cameras in here. There's lots of cameras. He's super awkward. Um, just a very interesting guy. But I started to pick up because he commented on every single house that had a camera. He'd be like, oh, there's lots of cameras in here. There's lots of cameras. Well, at one point I was like, I don't feel comfortable. He's not, he's not moving forward with like making offers, like he's setting. Like it just seemed like a setup for me. So I let it go. I I actually said, um, like I was sick or something. And I was like, my husband's so it would be happy to show you. And he was like, nope. Uh, when he, all of a sudden he was not interested in seeing homes anymore, um, I completely let my husband take it over and he follows up with him, he doesn't text him back. You didn't know that you were going on dates. Yeah, I literally <laughs> was like, why is he commenting so much on these cameras? Obviously he's not going to make a move if there's cameras in the home, but like clicked that I wasn't down to right. show him any more homes. But do you think that that was like, a, like when they're saying, oh, cameras, lots of cameras in here. What's your opinion on that? So here's, here's how I look at any situation. If you feel uncomfortable, that's all you need. Act on that. Yeah. Because there's not a single commission in the world that's worth you putting yourself at risk if your gut is telling you something's off. So I think he did exactly the right thing. Maybe he was just weird about cameras. And he didn't, you know, make, I, no telling, right? Could have been innocuous. It doesn't sound like it because like you said, as soon as you put a male in that scenario, he's like, now nah, I'm not interested anymore. It sounded like he might have been a predator. I, I, I'm watching this right now, watch, walk around my house. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think he did exactly the right thing. You trusted your gut and you diffused the situation by simply stepping out of the environment. That, that was perfect. Yeah. 
even if it was nothing, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you know, exactly. Exactly. the situation yeah. better safety. Sorry, judge, right? For sure. Absolutely. But the camera thing was uh, how much you said cameras. That was another like, yeah, stuck out. Yeah, that was sure. Good on you. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Holly, Dominique, are there some of you guys in the, the moms in real estate Facebook group that we started? Well, Holly yeah. and Dominique are actually on, on our real estate team. I invited oh, them. Yeah. Okay. We had invited some other gals I haven't yeah. met in person. So, that, that's awesome. So, I'm going to post. You have to be a mom. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I'm not. Uh, I'm 23. <laughs> well, it, it, we started the group because we did a panel discussion. Um, in fact, Sammy that we were just talking was on the panel. We just did a panel discussion of moms who have kids that work in real estate. So that's why it's a moms in real estate group. It's a, it's a, it's a unique dynamic that you have to deal with different situations. But this topic came up in, in that panel discussion is why we're actually doing this class. And um, do, you, do you guys have anything to add, Matt? Uh, I think, you know, I do have something to add. Uh, first off, that was really that was really a great course uh, or class or how you want to put it. I got the military mindset. We're all trying to go back to civilian world right now, but uh, I think what everybody needs to understand is that I, just as we are all going through a training right now, we're, we're we're getting these ideas and situational awareness, which are all great. You have to understand that these criminals they're they're going through training too. You know what I mean? Every time they they uh, they go see a house, they're like, oh hey, and they're observing all these cameras. They're going through trainings too. So the further, you have to understand, the further uh, as time goes by and you don't do these trainings, you don't, uh, firearms, for example, I carry, I train all the time. I don't care, like in this setting, I'm not gonna carry one because it'd be absolutely useless, right? A lot of times in homes, to me, it's useless. Uh, because I don't know where that round's gonna go or, or, you know what I mean? You have to train. Just remember, bad guys are always training. They're always doing what they do. That's what they do for a living. So if you're not training, right? And I'm not saying, you know, go uh, do Krav Maga every day or whatever. I think Krav Maga is awesome. Uh, but if that's not your thing, it's not your thing. But you've got to learn some, some tools, some techniques to defend yourself in situations. Uh, but again, great class it was awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I love that. I, like you said, well, you can't learn from a YouTube video, and you've yeah. got to practice it. But also, like Tori said, you can't practice it once. I got this. <laughs> right? You bring it on. Yeah. 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 So um, I'll get more tap my <laughs> Hey guys. Um. Hey Jake. Jake. We um. Hang on for a second here. Uh, I I'm assuming there's no more questions. I didn't see any hand raised, but we have a sponsor in our office here today that just brought us lunch. He's a great lender in our local uh, market here. He's been here before. He's done some trainings for us. Uh, Jake Bright is with uh, Solitude Mortgage. And um, so I want to introduce him and let him tell you a little bit about himself and what he can do for you. He's worked with uh, some of our agents before, and we're happy to have you back. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> yeah, it's been a couple months since I've been here. Um, Good to see some of you guys. Some of you guys I haven't met. I'm one of the owners of Solitude Mortgage. Um, we're a mortgage broker. So what that means is we've got, I think we're up to about 15 different options of places that we can send wow. certain scenarios, right? So especially on the self-employed side, Eric and I had a transaction that almost went really good and then didn't go very almost. well. <laughs> but it, it all worked out in the end. Um, Everybody knew what was going on, by the way. We gave them, well, a ton of notice, but it's good to be back here. So um, we, we operate on a very thin margin. Usually about half of the margin that a mortgage company makes. Um, so they typically around four, four and a half percent. We're right there on the 2% margin. So razor thin margins, really good pricing, really good rates. And um, we actually just won an award. Ironically, awesome. myself and Josh. So we're nice. we're in the top as far as mortgage brokers go. We're in the top half percent in the nation for fastest close times. Oh, so nice pretty cool there. Um, Josh, Josh is really presumptuous. Josh, my partner, by the way, he's really presumptuous. He's got it like on his desk, as we can see it <laughs> sitting in my drawer, and then I can tell you guys about it. Right? So, you can display it. He'll, here. he'll never know. Yeah. Um. Anyway, enjoy lunch. It's from Zao. I think it's pretty good. I usually bring it. Um. So enjoy. It's good to meet you guys. Awesome. Thanks. Cards, by the way. I, <laughs> he never leaves anything. Um, 
I signed up for an e-business card and then never set up the account. So, <laughs> so hey, um, I'll put his uh, contact information in our Facebook group. But Walt, thank you so much for joining us again and sharing. Um, copy those links out of the chat if you're online or reach out to me if you're somewhere where you can't do that right now. Make sure you get them. Um, this is just one aspect of Walt. Um, like I said, we've had another training and um, I'm going to keep in touch with him um, and plug into some of the stuff that he does um, and, and share him some more. So, Walt, again, thank you so much. My pleasure, man. You guys have a wonderful day. Enjoy your lunch. Thank okay. you, Walt. Thank, thank you. you. See you guys. That's fantastic. He's great. He's not. He's still.